Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone. It's seven o'clock, so we'll get going. Thank you for coming. I see Kyle came, his mother was texting me. Oh, Kyle's coming and brought us this moment is your miracle book. <laughs> beautiful. Uh, it's so beautiful to be here. Uh, we, we did a gathering last night at a Center for Spiritual Living, and so this is two in a row. And uh, just to welcome you all in, Svava is going to sing one of her beautiful songs. And it's, this one you're going to sing is I Found You? Yes. Okay. She's going to open it up with I Found You. Well, I'm just so grateful to be here, and thank you all for coming. You might have to speak loud in it. Can you hear me? Okay. It's going to be louder when I sing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or maybe we move this a little bit. Yep. There. Thanks. Found you. 
start <laughs> yeah all of these songs have come through Spava with her prayers and devotion and she went on YouTube taught herself how to play guitar she had some keyboard skills from when she was a little little girl and they came back <laughs> for her to make her songs so thank you it's such a gift for everyone yeah so precious you could feel the love well, welcome everyone. We're going to have a beautiful evening tonight, just diving, diving deep into the present moment. And here we are at Center for Spiritual Living and uh, the tradition of science of mind is very strong. And, and some of you have heard of science of mind or Christian science, the Course in Miracles. Uh, there's a lot of teachings that talk about the power of the mind. And there's also a lot of spiritualities that kind of dismiss the mind or uh, kind of bypass it a bit. And um, what, uh, someone's wanting to come in. There we go. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> come on in. And basically, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says that the mind is the activating agent of spirit. So let's say that in truth, we're spirit, we're eternal spirit. But Jesus calls the mind the activating agent of spirit. In other words, it's something where the Holy Spirit resides. It's where our, our comforter lives. It's where our communication device lives. That reaches us in words while we still believe in words, reaches us in symbols while we still believe in symbols. And that's why in the Bible, Jesus said, I will send a comforter. So this presence is so, so, so important. And there's one point where Jesus says, you are mind, holy mind, and purely mind. And, and what he's basically saying is that to believe in linear time and to believe in space, which Einstein even agrees with Jesus, that time and space are, are the same illusion. They're very relative. 
there's nothing absolute about time. If you study science you, and you go into Einstein's work, you see that time is not an absolute. They've even had uh, where they take atomic clocks and they have one on the ground and they set two atomic clocks identically and they, one, they fly one around the world in a supersonic plane and then they land it and they put the clocks together and guess what? They're not saying the same thing. Even modern day science and physics is showing us what Einstein said, that time and space are relative. And of course, time and space are perceptual. But the realm of heaven, or the realm of God, or the realm of spirit is, is prior to time. It's not, the present moment is not in between the past and the future. That was a trick. The ego made up the concepts of past, present, and future to delude the mind into uh, a, an identity that's very fleshy and it's very limited and it seems to be lacking all the time and it needs lots of care. And we can say, what well, are you talking about babies? And no, I'm talking about all human beings. <laughs> There's so much care and attention that's put on the body. Today I was coming here and I was reminded that the workbook lesson and Rev Bev gave me an original hard, hardbound workbook here, but it was 236. And basically the lesson of the day is that I, I rule my mind. Yes. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. And basically it's saying, there's a, I have a kingdom that I must rule. At times it does not seem I am its king at all. It seems to triumph over me and tell me what to feel, what to say. Basically, this whole world is a mesmerism of false cause and effect, where it seems like the conditions of the world, tsunamis, hurricanes, droughts, famine, um, COVID, uh, you know, pandemic and everything, it seems like the world is the determiner of our state of mind. When you ask somebody, are you having a good day? If they're having a good day, they probably will tell you what the things that are happening that are determining that good day. Uh, oh, I got a call from my daughter. I haven't heard from her for years. And this, and, and this came, and a check came in the mail, and so forth. And then if they're having a bad day, they'll tell you the things that are happening that are part of their bad day. So a bad day is like a, a judgment. I'm having a bad day, and here's the reasons why. What we learn from Ernest Holmes, we learned it from Mary Baker Eddy, we learned it from Jesus in A Course in Miracles, is that the mind is causative. And the world is a world of false effects. So if your mind is so powerful and you take that amazing God-given mind and you believe in the ego, which is the belief of separation from source, somehow there was a fall from grace or somehow we wandered off and got caught in a detour of time and we forgot bliss, we forgot eternal life, we forgot eternal happiness and joy. And what the journey is, is a journey to the present moment. But again, the present moment is not between the past and the future. The present moment is before time was. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He was teaching this 2,000 years ago. He was teaching that the presence of God is prior to time. He says in A Course in Miracles, you think time goes forward, but time goes backwards to an ancient instant that's long forgotten. He later on calls it the unholy instant, the time of terror, in which a tiny mad idea was taken seriously instead of being laughed at. The solution is to laugh. The problem was seriousness, taking error seriously, taking sin seriously, taking time and space seriously. And we can even see with little children, when little children are happy and they're playing, they actually lose track of time and space. Until mother goes, come on, it's dinner time, come on in, and they, they come back to time and space, but they're just happy in the moment. So 
the one thing I could say about the present moment is it's not between the past and the future, and the only way you can come into full awareness of it is through guidance. You can call it guidance from the Holy Spirit, you can call it guidance from your higher self, you can call it um, your intuition if you want. Maybe you don't like uh, religious terms, so just say, oh, I have an intuitive uh, self that's prompting me, nudging me, niggling me, telling me, you know, here, go here, go so-and-so, meet so-and-so, you know, it's, it's guiding us, that intuitive self. So my journey has been not only a journey that included religion, it included metaphysics, it included science and quantum physics. I'm happy talking about the Wizard of Oz, as I am about quantum mechanics, as I am about talking about theology. And with A Course in Miracles, Jesus comes through so loud and clear, and he says, this is just one form of the universal curriculum. There are many pathways to God. Isn't it refreshing to read a book that tells you that there's many pathways to God, instead of, this is the only way? <laughs> we have a great bookstore. Reverend Bev gave me this book here, Course in Miracles. It's coming back into awareness. And what Jesus is basically saying is, and is that everything is connected. In science, it scared Einstein. He, he came upon a connectedness that scared him and all of the first quantum physicists, and therefore Einstein called this overriding universal connection of the whole cosmos, spooky action at a distance. Whenever you put spooky, <laughs> in front of it, you know the scientist is a little afraid of whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but it's spooky. Because the molecules were being tested at great distances and they were showing that they were connected. There was no separation. In quantum physics, this is called the quantum field. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus has a few names for it. He calls it the happy dream. He calls it the real world. He calls it true perception. He's basically saying, when you look upon this world without judgment, you will finally see it as a dream. And you'll be happy because you see it without judgment. Finally. <laughs> you'll see it from this high perspective in your mind. It's kind of like a needle in a haystack. It's there. You'll find it. Everyone is destined to find the, the needle in the haystack. It just um, seems to be a matter of time. But I would say it's more a matter of willingness and desire. If you desire to know the truth, you will come to that experience. Because the mind is that powerful. And what you call forth, giving and receiving are the same. If you desire God above all else, you come into an experience of happiness, of joy, and of bliss. And I'm not talking incremental or up and down happiness. I'm talking about consistent happiness and joy. I'm talking about being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. The Holy Spirit's curriculum is, is a curriculum of joy. The happy lesson of forgiveness is learned through happiness. You don't learn the final lesson through pain. You don't learn it through anguish or suffering. You, you don't learn it through any type of sacrifice or punishment or penance. Happy lessons are reached through happiness. If you're going to reach eternal life, you have to reach it for through the life of the present moment. And to be present is simply to have no concerns whatsoever about the past and no interest, a complete lack of interest in the future. Does that seem radical? Yeah, on this planet, that's pretty radical. And that's what sometimes people talk about a conversion experience. That's just like igniting this quest to be fully present, is really what that conversion experience is. So, for me, I would say uh, the, the last 36 years have been extremely miraculous because because I really didn't do anything. <laughs> That's the best part. You know, you go through experiences for th these last 36 years of working with Jesus and the Course, and then you have this realization, wow, I, 
I didn't do anything. And nothing was done to me. And then you start to realize that, that all things have always been in this pristine state of mind. They've always been there, but they just weren't recognized. And the whole point was to just recognize from this higher perspective. So, in quantum physics, the, you know, we know Newtonian science, you know, okay, Isaac Newton, good try, but he, he basically used the scientific method to try to draw from experiments um, data from the world to deduce what must be real. Only problem is the world's a projection. So if you follow the scientific method and you believe that the world's linear and it's outside your mind, then you will just come up with things like illnesses, diagnosis, um, struggles, uh, physics. For every action, there's a reaction. You know, it, it touches every, uh, every genre, every category. If you go to university, all of the categories are based on Newtonian physics. And then quantum physics, which started around the early 1900s, We've got, we've got Mary Baker Eddy coming in there with her Christian science and Ernest Holmes coming in with science of mind. And Einstein saying time and space are not what we think they are. Everybody's coming together with one harmonious message of saying, we don't know what's going on. We have no clue what we're perceiving. We are so clueless, and yet, while we think we know something, we're blocked from knowing everything. Because you can't know in part, you can only know the whole. So, Einstein helped us out, and I, I do like to show, I show a lot of movies. I, I invoke the presence of Einstein, I invoke the presence of Yogananda, I invoke all the mystics and saints, all the scientists, all the great philosophers, which I, I showed a series one time called The Philosophy of the Matrix. So I took the movie The Matrix and I took all these all-time great classical philosophers that all were telling bits and pieces of what's in the Matrix. And the, at the time, the Wachowski brothers, now they're the Wachowski sisters, but they put it all together in a movie that somehow people were touched by, like, wow, there's something there. That was, I think for a lot of people, that was a modern introduction to the great philosophers of the world, because it was acted out so well with Morpheus and Neo. You are the one. <laughs> you know, the, the prophecies, the destiny. So, quite simply, you have only one purpose, and that is to wake up from this dream. It may seem that we have multiple purposes, and it's very stressful when you think you have multiple purposes and multiple functions. Jesus makes it very simple and clear for us. He says, you only have one function, and that function is forgiveness. And when you accept that function fully, you will realize that your forgiveness function and your happiness are one. That really, when you were pursuing forgiveness, you were just pursuing happiness. Jesus says you have every right to want to be happy. You have every right to want to be free. You have every right to want to be peaceful. You've just been looking in the wrong place. You've been looking in time and space for the peace of mind. You've been looking in time. When I get the promotion, when I get the house, when I get the the facelift, when I get something, when I get my bank account to reach a certain level, when I get certain amount of possessions, when I have children, when my children graduate finally, <laughs> my, no, when my children graduate and get married, okay, but when my children get graduate, get married, and have good, good career, <laughs> then I'll be happy. You see, I'll be happy when he's always putting it off into the future. And Jesus is teaching us, much like Einstein was teaching us, that the future is a projection of the past. So, if you think you're caught in a karmic wheel, it's because you believe in the past. And therefore, the future just replicates 
it goes on and on playing out the same riddle of what am I, who am I? The only question that's meaningful, the, the first question Jesus says that was ever asked was, what am I? And Christ doesn't ask that question because Christ knows the, the source of Christ, the, the Creator. But when the mind falls asleep, it starts off with, what am I? And then the trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of questions are all just derivations of what am I? Every question, honey, will you bring home some apples when you come home from work? That's an identity question. You know, that's an identity question. Every question that was ever asked is a question of identity. So you see how the Chorus is just saying, let's simplify this. Wouldn't you like to experience a state of mind where the questions are all dissolved? Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be a stress-free life? If you had no questions, you were, your mind was totally still, peaceful, restful, joyful, happy, loving, constantly, with no questions. Not a single question arising in mind. And all of the questions that human beings experience are coming from the subconscious. Because the subconscious mind is, is where everything is stored. It stores the past. It stores every sensation, every nuance, everything that we seem to experience in time is, is already part of a prearranged script that's already been answered and is already over and done. So, in A Course in Miracles, in Workbook Lesson 158, Jesus says, you know, we are merely reviewing mentally what has already gone by. When you go to a movie, you're, you walk into the theater and you know you're watching something that's already been shot, it's, been, it's celluloid, if we're talking old-time movie theaters now, we have to stay away from the digital for a moment, but you, you're watching something, the movie's already been shot, and yet when you watch the movie, your mind engages if, if it's still happening. You're watching the character, and then it's a, it's a suspense movie, and Julia Roberts is walking down the dark corridor, and she's starting to open doors, and you're like, no, don't do it, Julia, don't open that door, don't do it. And the music's going, dun, 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 and your heart's going, and you're wondering, because you've become engaged in the movie. That's why you spent the 1250 or whatever it is now to go in there, to be entertained, to be engaged. But you're engaged in something that is just celluloid projected onto a screen. It's just shadows. Like Plato's great cave analogy, you know, the great cave analogy, just shadows on the, on the, cliff, on the wall of the cave. And the prisoners are locked up, and all they see are the shadows, but they can't see the light, and they can't see the puppets and the marionettes. So, and that's a great analogy, that, that even though we perceive a world as if it's solid and concrete, if we're not aware of the shadow thoughts that are producing this, then we really are not even close to escaping from the perceived world. We have to be aware that there's grievances in the subconscious mind. There's attack thoughts, there's hurtful thoughts, and those hurtful thoughts were, are so intense, intensely painful, that they've been pushed out of awareness and they pushed, pushed into the subconscious mind. So you might say that your whole journey of spiritual awakening is allowing the unconscious to become conscious, so that you can, in the end, be fully conscious. Isn't that what we all want? We want to be aware. Who wants to know that there's a subconscious mind that's programming and conditioning? Most people feel like, well, here's what my situation, I was born in this place, and this to these people, to this family, and oh, wow, I've carried a lot of baggage and, and conditioning with me. And most people, even if you talk to them every day, and you get into something a little deeper and they start to tell you, here's where I'm from and, oh, I'm still, I'm still trying to escape my conditioning. 
And that seems to be the human condition, trying to escape the conditioning of the past. But what if that past is subconscious? What if Freud was just discovering something that's always been there? What if Carl Jung found the shadow? What if the shadow's always been there? Even if you look back in other cultures in, in prehistoric times, you will find that there's through hieroglyphics and through the writings of the culture, there is talk of, of the shadow self, of evil, of darkness. It comes in many forms. Joseph Campbell has, if you read and watch enough Joseph Campbell, you can see all these symbols throughout human history. Crucifixions, resurrections, life, death, the same things play out. And then there's William Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. To be fully present or not to be fully present, that is the question. To be fully present is the answer to every question that was ever asked. And that's where you can actually come into a state of mind where you realize that you didn't do anything wrong ever and you didn't do anything right ever either because you were not the puppet, you were not the doer. That's where the guilt is gone. That's where the divine innocence shines. When you are convinced, when you have that spiritual experience, wow, I am a perfect child of God right now and I have always been a perfect child of God because God created me perfect as spirit. We're not trying to make a messiah complex for everyone, so you go out the door and go, I am the Holy Son of God, hear me now, <laughs> you know. No, it's, you, you become humble in your true identity because you become hushed, you become hushed in reverence to the Creator. You realize that you either were created by a loving God or you tried to make yourself be something different than that love. And that's what we all must face. Jesus says, well, do you, do you like what you made? And well, people say, some of it I do. I enjoy some of it. And other parts, no. <laughs> Can I take it back? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Murder, rape, <laughs> war. You know, even people who get into the idea of manifesting, they like the idea of manifesting until they start to look at some aspects of this world and they go, that's not me. <laughs> I like to be able to manifest the good and the right and the just and the lovely, but leave the evil, dark, warring, murderous part out. And that's why Jesus tells us in the Course, he says, you're afraid of your thoughts now. You're afraid of what you're convinced you did. You believe that you separated from God when you actually couldn't. You could never separate yourself from God because God didn't create you as a being that could separate. <laughs> God doesn't know you as a being that could separate. A lot of times, Somebody told me there was a running joke about, uh, from the, in Genesis, it says, um, God created man in his likeness and image. And the running joke is, and man returned the favor and created God in man's likeness and image. That's why in the Bible, people get confused when they see God zapping a tribe. That's very human. Uh, do we really think a God of pure love is going to zap anybody. That doesn't make any sense. There's a big long word for it. It's called anthropomorphism. When, you're, when you make an anthropomorphic God, you assign human characteristics and feelings, like anger, to God. And that is the biggest joke that there could ever be, because the real God, the Creator, I'm not talking about the Creator of time and space, the ego projected time and space, but the Creator of Spirit is pure love, pure eternal bliss. And that God is so loving that, that, that the Holy Spirit was 
an extension that came from that as a helper, say a helper who can see the illusion but he knows that it's not true. That's the kind of helper I want. The one that can see the illusion, can see the defiled altar and look past the defiled altar to the truth and keep a steady gaze on the light. That's the kind of helper you need. No matter what you seem to do, the Holy Spirit only comes back to the remembrance of the true nature. So that's why it's a helper, the comforter, because it's a bridge back to remembering the truth. So the thing about it is, is you when Jesus says you're entitled to freedom, peace, happiness, and joy, when I was in university for, for 10 years, full-time undergraduate and graduate, I used to walk in in a park that was next to this big University of Cincinnati, it's called Burnett Woods, and I would walk and I would go feed the ducks or watch the geese and walk through the forest and ponder, what is this all about? What's it all about? I'm in university, I'm not finding any clear answers <laughs> to what's, what are my ontological questions I'm not finding answers to. And then as I walked around, Jesus did tell me, he said, you are entitled to perfect happiness, perfect joy, perfect peace, perfect love, but your means of going about it are crazy. Uh, you're trying to learn your way back to heaven and all of the world is learned, it's false learning. So you actually need to unlearn everything that you've ever learned. That's what Buddha said, that's what Lao Tzu said, that's what Ramana Maharshi said, that's what Jesus said, that's what, uh, you know, even modern Eckhart Tolle, you know, you have to unlearn everything that you believe to know who you are. Because this is a world of false perception. It was made from the belief in separation. I remember one time I was up in Edmonton, Canada many years ago, and there was a big congregation and it was, it was a science of mind church like this. I thought, oh, fantastic, I love to get invited to science of mind churches. And, and then I'm thinking, what's going on at the church? And I looked at the program and they were doing like a, like a 12 part series on Buddha. I said, oh, I love an open-minded church, a church that's doing a 12 part series on Buddha. That's open-minded. Well, I got up there though and I just started to speak and I introduced myself and I welcomed everybody and then I started to talk a little bit about the believed separation, the believed fall from grace, and, and I started to talk a little bit about the ego. And then after like, I was just getting going, I was only 10 minutes into the talk, there was an elderly woman in the front and she just went like this. She said, she said, hey, 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 stop, stop, stop. You have been talking about this ego and you have not said one good, kind thing about the ego. It's all negative. So stop. So I just took a drink of my water. I said, the water. Okay. And then I said, the ego wants you dead. She was like, and I continued on with the talk for another couple, two or three hours. Yeah, that's it. The ego wants you dead. The ego is a death wish. There is nothing constructive about a death wish. There is nothing constructive about a belief that you aren't who you really are. There is nothing constructive about a belief in pain, suffering, sickness, what we could say, the generator of, of illusions, the generator of lies, of, of falsehoods. And that's why once you start to understand that the ego belief is a death wish, if you really hear what I'm saying, you'll devote the rest of your life now to letting this unconscious ego be brought to light so that you are no longer run emotionally and perceptually by a death wish. You know, and Jesus said, the last to be overcome shall be death. That's what the crucifixion and the resurrection was just, it was just a skit. 
he had already accepted the resurrection in his mind before he went on his public ministry, before he even called the apostles, that mind was resurrected. That mind, of course, was speaking words like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That was the universal spirit speaking through the body, the puppet of Jesus. So it wasn't saying that Jesus, the man, was the way, the truth, and the life. But it was saying the presence, the I am presence, is in all cultures, in all situations, no matter what names you give to it. You could call it intuition, Atman, you could call it higher self, call it whatever you want. Call it Fred, call it Jane, call it anything. It doesn't matter, the names don't matter, but the, uh, that I am presence is so bright and so brilliant and so present that only the belief in the ego keeps the mind from being aware of that light. And when I say mind, I'm talking divine mind. God, you were created with a divine mind. That's what Ernest Holmes was, Holmes was talking about, the founder of this uh, fellowship. So, once I really opened A Course in Miracles back in 1986, I had this like tsunami of love that felt like washing over me, and I thought my life is never going to be the same. And it's like the title of your song, I found it, I found you. I found you, <laughs> I found you, I found you, I found you. And, and which mountain should I go to, to ascend? And then they, all the angels left and Jesus left and went, ha ha, he thinks he's, he's ready to ascend. He's at A in the alphabet and he thinks he's at Z. <laughs> Cosmic humor, everyone laughs, ha ha ha. You're just at the beginning. And, and the beginning is when you just realize that you have something in your heart that wants to be free, that wants to know God, that wants to be free of the ego. And you're not even going to try to mince and blend things and say, well, there's some helpful aspects to the ego. No, I can tell you there are none. <laughs> and I've found consistent happiness by by transcending it, by with, with much help from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, transcending it. The last, uh, was it last night we were at the Center for Spiritual Living in uh, Seal Beach, and the woman who introduced us said she was watching a bunch of YouTubes of mine years ago, and she's a psychotherapist, and she said, there's something wrong with this guy. <laughs> There's something really wrong with this guy. So she watched more videos and more videos. She tried to put her finger out, what's wrong with this guy? There's something really wrong. And then finally she went, huh, he doesn't seem to have an ego. That's what's wrong. <laughs> that, it stands out as you're a psychotherapist and seeing clients all day. That was like, something's fishy here. But the thing was, was when you give yourself over to this, it does turn into like a fairy tale. I've told stories of all the miracles I've experienced, not all of them, there was no way to tell all of them, but, but even when you tell a, a large majority of the miracles, people will say, your life sounds like a fairy tale. ba dum ba dum ba dum and then things showed up, and things showed up, and things showed up, and things dropped in, and things dropped in, and synchronicities, and are they coincidences? No, they're miracles. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of them. And when your mind starts to get flooded with miracles, then you realize, oh, that's what I'm meant to be doing. As Jesus says, you're meant to be habitually miracle-minded. <laughs> Isn't that a good use of habitually? <laughs> Every time we talk about habits, they usually, oh, bad habit. Jesus says, why don't you make the miracle a, a, a habit? Why don't you become habitually right-minded, habitually aligned with God? See how your life goes. See how your eyes sparkle. See how you light up when you're habitually miracle-minded. You know, everything goes your way. You know, I had a raising the dead experience. That's not usually common for human beings. But I did have, I, I was going, bringing a plate of food uh, to my grandmother, my elderly grandmother. And I would always go to the same grocery store, go to the salad bar, and I would always make her the salad. She was cottage cheese, you know, 
Lillian's favorite things, you know, pick them at the salad bar, take them to your grandmother. But this time I was told, go to a, a different um, grocery store than you go, a different one. Okay. And I should have known there was something going on because I was doing the course workbook lessons and I happened to be on the workbook lesson. There is no death. The son of God is free. When you're doing that workbook lesson, you should be ready for a raising the dead experience. Because when the raising the dead experience came, it actually felt very natural. You know, I wasn't like, watch it. Who saw that? <laughs> I was actually in my, my workbook lesson. There is no death. The Son of God is free. And that was going through my mind while I watched a woman who was laying on the floor and the paramedics had tried to work on her and then the paramedics left and she was just, it was just a body laying there, not moving. There was no diaphragm moving, no lung movement. But then I was by the frozen food section, she had me by the frozen, and I was touching it and I was watching. And like a Rolodex in my mind, I was doing what course students are supposed to do, have the thought for the day in your mind and give your whole heart to there is no death, the Son of God is free. And I watched the, her lungs start moving again, and I watched her start breathing. It went from a, a lifeless, still body to a breathing. And then people came and so on and so forth. And I just went on to my grandmother's apartment with the food, with the salad. Because even as I'm at the checkout, Jesus is like, yeah, okay, this is, miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. You see how Jesus is calling us, miracles are natural. If you're having a bad day, something has gone wrong. Your thinking <laughs> is on some kind of an ego detour. But for me, I felt the presence, I felt this energy here and like third eye energy and all kinds of things going on, but, but that wasn't the point. The point was, these lessons set your mind free, and you're only asked to do the lessons. You're just asked to do the lessons. He says you don't, may not even believe in them. You, some of them you may actively resist. It does not matter. Just do them. Wow, that's a strong instruction. Just do them. It's what Holy Spirit is just basically saying. Let me show you. I'll show you. You doubt. But I know the truth. You doubt, but I will convince you. You want to make the correction? No. Resign now. As your own teacher, <laughs> there is an inner teacher that can take you to the present moment. But it's not the personal you that think, thinks it can learn things and achieve skills and abilities. There's one point in the Course where Jesus says, you can develop your abilities in this world to such an extent that it will get you out of the world. Isn't that hopeful? You can develop your abilities to such an extent that it can get you out of this world. And then he goes on to say, he said, this world is actually an impossible situation. No wonder we've dealt with stress, anxiety, depression. No wonder there's suicide. No wonder there's all this crazy insanity. It's because Jesus is saying, this world is an impossible situation. But if you develop your skills and abilities to a certain extent with the Holy Spirit's help, they will help you escape from this world of time and space. You will know eternal life because God created you as an eternal being. So, the, the thing that happens is, as you go forward, you start to find yourself being healed of addictions, healed of, of things that were petty grievances, healed of these things that were, you were just clinging to and holding on to. For what reason? Why do we hold on to a grievance, really? Do we really think? We're going to benefit by holding a, a grudge and a grievance. And yet, that is a common thing on earth to have long standing grievances that go on for, for many years. And then sometimes, through just a, something that's like serendipitous or surprise, then suddenly it's, it's gone. 
you meet the the person that you hated for 20 years, you meet them and you think, they're so sweet. What was I thinking? <laughs> Why was I grinding away? <laughs> grinding away on my mind on them, and they're actually adorable. <laughs> and Jesus is like, yeah, they are adorable. That's true. They are adorable. So, we're just here to have a discussion. We, we do have this mic, which has a nice long wire, and, and we have that mic. Yeah. And do you feel to maybe sing another song? Sure. Yeah. You hear all that I'm talking about, and it's like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about singing a song called Only Love. It came in my mind when you were talking. <laughs>
Let's, let's go into practicality. If the whole world of time and space was made by the ego and it's just all symbols, then what could be more joyful, more happy than the Spirit's use of symbols to help you to go beyond the symbols? In heaven, there are no words because words are, what Jesus says, but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So, we know even from the Torah, the, the ancient Jewish tradition and the, and the Bible, and now we have A Course in Miracles and we have the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran and all kinds of amazing channeled writings and so forth, but uh, you will not reach God with words. You, words are very crude, they're very rudimentary. It's, it's, it would be like trying to reach God through words is trying to like take tweezers and go out to Huntington Beach and take the sand off of Huntington Beach one tweezer pick at a time. If you could just imagine going as you see this beach stretching for miles and miles and you've got your little tweezers ready, I'm ready, it, it, it would be ridiculous. And and so what Jesus teaches us in the Course, even though he has 31 chapters, very good, very good theology, but you have to unlearn that too. I had to unlearn the Course to go springing into happiness that's beyond the words. But 31 chapters, and it's got 365 workbook lessons and a manual for teachers and a clarification of terms. But what Jesus says in the Course is prayer is the medium of 
miracles. Prayer. He doesn't say words are the medium of miracles. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he poked fun at the scribes and the Pharisees who were always studying and writing and rehearsing and studying and talking about the words. And that they kind of got into that a little too much. And Jesus said, I'm here to demonstrate really the spirit of the law, and you're caught on the letter. And this will be, in this generation, the, the opportunity for Course in Miracles students to not get caught on the words. <laughs> Do not get caught on the words. Do not get caught on the metaphysics. Do not get caught on the theology. It's just another book with words in, but it's a beautiful use of those words. You might say it's the Spirit's very profound use of words. It's a very straight shot to God. Not if you cling to the words. It's, it'll be just as long and difficult as the rest if you get into, like the scribes and the Pharisees. If you turn into a modern-day scribe <laughs> or Pharisee with the Course, you're not, you're not going to be happy. Just be talkative, maybe, but not happy. But uh, prayer is the meaning of a miracle. So, so I remember with the publishers, Judy Scutch Whitson, who's a friend of mine, they formed this uh, nonprofit organization called the Foundation for Inner Peace. And when I would have lunch with her, I had many different lunches and dinners with her, she just would say, well, when we have a board meeting, we pray. When we have to make decisions, we pray. We basically just pray. We listen, we pray, listen, and follow. That's how we have this organization. There was even another group. Some of, has anybody heard of the Urantia book? Uh, the, there are some people that came from the Urantia Foundation and they say, how, how has this course spread all over the world? What are you doing? Can we take a look at your business plan? And Judy said, well, actually, we don't have a business plan. We just pray and listen and follow. And that's how the course was printed initially. Because the four of them got together and they just prayed for what to do with the, it was in black binders, not in this form. And uh, they were they were guided. Judy will hear the answer, and and um, she heard make the commitment first. Like Jesus was not even going to give them instructions what to do with the black binders and and the course until they made the commitment. What were they committing to? Helen and Bill were research psychologists. Judy was an academic, and so was Ken Wapnick. So we've got four academic professionals, and, and Jesus saying, make the commitment first. He was asking them to commit their entire lives to his course before he would even give them instructions on how it was to be printed. That's a good note for everyone because Commitment. Everybody knows in a relationship you have to have commitment. In a career you have to have commitment. I mean, basically anything that you want to bring forth in this world that as a goal, everyone knows it takes a lot of work, hard work and commitment, and a lot of effort. Well, spiritual awakening is the same thing. If you have believed in the ego, we'll say for a millennium, and now you're going to be free of it, it's going to take commitment. And I know even for me, when I first came across the Course, and I had it for a while, and I used it like an oracle to, uh, to speak to me, but I could tell that's what Jesus wanted from me. He, he wanted my whole life. He, he wanted me with no future ambitions, no future goals, no future. He wanted my mind wholly at, at His use, for the plan of awakening. Career, forget about it, as they say in Italian, forget about it. Career, family, forget about it. For future, goal, forget about it. What do you want to achieve and accomplish in this world? Forget about it. Do you want to heal? Yes! <laughs> yes, I want to heal. Yes, I give you everything. I give you my bank account, which doesn't have much in it, Jesus. You'll find that out. I'll give you my possessions. I don't have many. I'll give you my relationships. I'll give it all to you, and then you can direct me and instruct me. 
And so now, 36 years later, I've been in 44 countries, around the world, many, many, many times, like a spinning top, and been in hermitages for long stretches of time, and med deep meditations, fasted, done all the things that you do in terms of spirituality. But in the end, it's all just to be happy. It's all just to be happy and joyful in the moment. That's what it is. And in the end, you realize you didn't do any of it. You just said yes. You just somewhere in your heart said yes. I, I'm coming. Use me. I, you know the way. I will step back and I will follow. At the beginning, you know, with 10 years of full-time university, Jesus was like, hmm, oh, you've got a lot to unlearn. <laughs> I said, wasn't that good? That was a lot of work. You know, all the papers I, you know, and, and the grades and everything. He said, you've got a lot of work. Let's just leave it. <laughs> you've learned a lot of things that need to be unlearned. You're in need of following instructions. And so he took me with the things that I had resistance to. Like, I really didn't like to travel. David, back in those days, 20, maybe 28 years old. David was not keen on traveling. Jesus said, we're going traveling. And then I had a degree in urban planning. I would have planned, if I was going to travel around the United States, I would make some plans. I would not just go out on the road with no plans. Jesus said, I'll give you some guidance, and you just follow what I say. I say, okay, what's the first guidance? I'm, he, he guided me to get a little three-cylinder car, Great gas mileage. The thing basically drove on fumes. Great gas mileage. Right? He knows what. He even selected the car for me, this and that. But I didn't have any church support, no organizational support. Where's the money going to come? Where's Where am I going to sleep? How am I going to eat? He, I'll take care of all that. You just show up for me. You show up for me. I'll take care of all the rest. The car, the gas. Yes, 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 yes. But I, I don't have the money, I don't have, the, there's no money in the bank. Yes, just go, go on the road, I'll take care of the rest. So the first trip was five and a half weeks, then back. That went all the way across the United States and up to Canada and back. And then the second one was about six weeks. And thus began 36 years of, I will step back and let him lead the way. Very different from the way I was raised. I was raised with the Protestant work ethic. I was raised that you, you work, you earn, you save, you spend. Protestant work ethic. I think a few of you too, a, a lot of us were raised with that. And Jesus said, well, you believe that you can take care of yourself as a person and you don't understand how much pride and arrogance is even in the idea of self-sufficiency. Work, study, work, earn, save, spend. He said, you have no idea of the arrogance of thinking that you can create yourself and, and maintain yourself as apart from God. You have no idea how arrogant that is. I thought it was pretty, I thought, I was raised well. And Jesus said, the ego is a poor teacher. You've been raised on the ego, and now you have to unlearn everything that you've ever learned. And thus, when I went on these trips, oh, that was interesting for the ego. Yeah. Going out and trusting, I would say things like, have you ever traveled across the United States? Do you know what it's like? Do you expect me to end up like a bag lady in Chicago on the streets? If I keep following this, this is my fear that I'm going to be a homeless person. And he said, you're already homeless. You're homeless. You think you have a home. You think you're a time-space creature, but you're not home at all. You're, you're not even close. And you need instruction. You need help. You need to learn about divine providence. Think of Mother Teresa, Divine Providence. Think of St. Francis. I said, yeah, there's not that many examples of Divine Providence, but there's plenty of examples of Horatio Alger stories. You know, work, work your fingers to the bone to earn and save and earn and save and build a self. Build a self. 
you know how much work it takes. And Jesus is like, yeah, you've been poorly taught, poorly taught to think that you personally are responsible for yourself or anybody else, even children. He says, you don't understand the arrogance that's involved in taking personal responsibility for survival of a body that God didn't create. That body is something the Holy Spirit can use as a, as a communication device. That's actually the only purpose that the body has, is a communication device. But when you use it for other things, and then you wonder why it gets, seems to get sick or it seems to die, Jesus says, it's no surprise. You have unconscious guilt. You believe in death, so you experience death. No death in heaven, but you believe it, so you perceive it. He even says in the Course, he said, no one dies without their own consent. No one dies without their own consent. So I would rather give my consent to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and say, guide me, lead me, show me, show me the way, than give consent to a death wish that has set this whole world up to be a witness of separation, sickness, suffering, and death. And, and once you start to get into it, you know, at the beginning, you know, you've, you've got your questions, you've got your doubts, you've got your things coming up, but, but the more you give it over, I look at these big gold letters, at the, it's got exit in bright green and let go and let God. I'm doing the whole talk with this facing me, exit in bright green, let go and let God. It, it is living a life of faith. It's living a life of trust, but not trust based on past learning. That, I tried it. I, I was in university for full time for 10 years, and I believe I studied, I mean, I went from conservatory of music, engineering, urban planning, philosophy, psychology, anthropology, women's studies. I mean, I just went and did the whole thing over and over and over. And then after 10 years of that, Jesus said, are you ready now to let go and let God? You're not going to reach God with your intellect. You will reach God through surrendering everything you believe and everything you think you know. But you know nothing. And, and as long as you remember that you know nothing, I can teach you. But if you already think you know, I can't work with you. I have to wait. I have to be patient. Because there, Jesus is saying, I'm your equal. We're the same one. He even says in the Course, he said, I cannot take your fear away because if I took your fear away, that would be interfering with the most basic law of the universe, which is cause and effect. What is he saying? I cannot intervene or interfere between your thoughts and the effects of your thoughts. You are literally perceiving a motion picture of your consciousness. And I can't intervene unless you ask me to come and show me and instruct me on how to get past these grievances and attack thoughts. You see the difference between, save me Jesus, save me Jesus, come into my life and save me, versus help me Jesus, instruct me with your Holy Spirit, guide me with your Holy Spirit, you know, they always said, you know, instead of giving people fish, you should teach people how to fish. And Jesus, instead of just saying, oh, you're enlightened, he says, I will give you instructions to reach enlightenment. You see, we have to actually practice and follow the instructions. It's not like this beam of light just comes and zaps you over the head. And then others don't get zapped. <laughs> it's all there for us, but we have to follow the instructions. And when we do follow the instructions, it, it's glorious. It's, it goes amazingly well. So, I, I'm interested in music, movies, philosophy, psychology, religion, uh, everything. I, I can I can talk about this using sports analogies if you want that. I can, I can use dating analogies. I did a movie last Saturday where I took the concept of infidelity and I took it all the way back 
to what was the seeming first infidelity because people get so angry around in, infidelity in this world you know i'll never forgive you i never want to speak to you again i hope i never see you again you know but what what was the first infidelity that's believing in the ego because when god created us it wasn't a passive creation Jesus says, you actually answered in the affirmative when you were created. You actually went, yes. You actually didn't say, just like, oh, thank you, thank you, I take it, take feathers hitting you. That's perfect, I'm eternal. Uh, no, you actually said yes. So to believe in the ego is the first infidelity. Not a real infidelity, but in, in terms of awareness, if you believe you're something that you're not, that's got to hurt. If you believe you're something you're not. So that was the original infidelity, was the belief that you could separate from the source. And then all the projected infidelities, they have, has nothing to do with sexuality. It has everything to do with self-honesty. Am I as God created me or did I create myself? That's the question. That's the that's our modern version of Shakespeare. <laughs> Am I as God created me, or can I make myself different from the way God created me? So, I think I we have microphones here. Maybe is is anybody have any kind of topic or question that you are have a burning thought in your mind? Like I would like to ask about this particular topic or anything, and we we can. You could, we would like you to just speak it into a microphone so... It's not so long. No, but so people can, can hear it. Everybody can hear it. Yeah, so come here up, up here. Yeah. If anybody feels they'd like to, so I was... I use my mic. Mm. Okay. Yeah. David, I have a question. Yes. My question is, when you were going all over the country, your little car. Yeah. You didn't tell us how you survived. Yes. Okay, I can so tell you that. Be more specific about that. Yes, I will. How how did that go out? That's an interesting parable. <laughs> it's one of the early parables. Well, the the first day, I think I drove. Um, I think I drove into. I got all the way over to Missouri for the first night, and and then. The second day of my driving, I, I was, of course, having wonderful holy encounters with the people I was meeting. I, I landed in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I, I was really driving pretty a lot of miles there to go from Cincinnati to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when I, I landed there, Spirit guided me to a to a uh, a campground. So I sat there and I made friends with all these people at a campground, and there was a blind man there who who played the guitar and sang, and we spent the whole night singing together uh, as I stayed there. The second night, I think I made it over to, the second night I made it to Oklahoma City, and you may know with A Course in Miracles, they had this thing, it was called A Course in Miracles International Bed and Breakfast Network, and I had taken Xerox copies of it. Spirit said, make some copies. So as I went into Tulsa, it was a Sunday morning. You're a minister. You know what goes on at a church on Sunday morning. But I looked on there and they said, I think the service was in the morning and then there was like a Course in Miracles group that was ending at 12 o'clock noon. And I looked at, I was guided to this church in, in Tulsa. And I looked and I looked the course group ends, okay, Jesus, the course group ends at 12, and it's it's about 11.55. And I said, I'm not going to walk into a Course of Miracles group where I don't even know the people. On the, For the last five minutes, he said, that's right, get in there. So I walked in, I sat down. They were having a big, heated Course of Miracles discussion about sexuality. And they were all fired up, and I think this, I think this, the Course says this, but none of it. So I sat there, and then, doop, it was noon, very quick. And then they looked and they said, where did you come from? And I said, 
I just was guided. I came in here and they're like, great. Oh, what's your name? Da, da, da. But, you know, Southern hospitality. Oh, come on, come on. And then this guy named Jack, he said, I'm taking a bunch of people out for lunch. I, I want you to come out to lunch. I'm taking, and we're all going, Course in Miracles group going out. So he takes us out, he buys everyone lunch. He says, where, where are you uh, living? I said, I'm just out driving across the country. And he said, well, come on back home with me then. I've got some work to do, but you stay at my house. Here, you play tennis. There's a tennis court here. There's a jacuzzi there. Totally invited me in, said, eat anything out of the refrigerator for a man I had never met. Well, believe me, this was 36 years ago, and that's happened a lot. It, when Jesus says in the Course, I will orchestrate time and space for you if you will be a miracle worker for me, he means literally orchestrate time and space. So, I was there, I was there all afternoon, I think I relaxed on the couch, read the Course, didn't use the tennis court, I might have used the jacuzzi, I think. He comes home, he's like, about five o'clock, well, I got my work done. I'd like to, let's go out for a barbecue and on my houseboat and I'm going to call all these people up and you seem to know a lot about A Course in Miracles. Let's do a, a boat party tonight. And this was my second night out on the road with Jesus. And I'm like, holy cow, if this is, if this is going to be like this, oh my God. I'm a shy guy from Cincinnati and this is like way beyond. So sure enough, he said, hey, come on, David's still here. Let's do a potluck, Course of Miracles potluck on my boat. We went out. The moon was coming up. We're on the lake at night, Sunday night. We're, we're having watermelon and spitting the watermelon seeds out onto the lake. And I'm like thinking, this is surreal. This is what happens when you let Jesus run your life. <laughs> and that boat ride, and when, I, when we pulled in, he said, well, it's Sunday night, all of us have to go to work tomorrow, but you're welcome to stay on the boat as long as you want. And this is the kind of open-ended love and generosity when you let the Spirit go before you. Because I had all the same fears, like, what, where am I going to get the gas, and where am I going to sleep? And that was the second night out, and then it continued. Uh, also, Oklahoma City, there was a woman named Marcella that I had met up at Ken Wapnick's place up in uh, the Casco Mountains. And she took me to the Cow Oklahoma City Cowboy Museum. You, these people welcome you into their house, I mean, to, to stay, and they feed you and they, you have all these deep discussions. That's why he wanted me on that boat. He wanted me to tell what the Course had to say about sexuality, because they were having a big, big debate in the Course group. So that's why he did the whole potluck. And it went on and on and on and on. I see Kyle's here tonight. That's how I was doing, taking a trip to uh, the East Coast, and I, I, I found, I think it was the same Bed and Breakfast Network or something, his mother, Cindy, was there, and I said, okay, I'll come and visit you. Where are you living? I, I live on High Street. High Street, I said. You live on High Street? What's the name of the town? Hartville. You live on High Street on, in Hartville? Oh, yeah. It's not my house, but, but the woman, uh, Carol, said I can live here for free as long as I want. Okay. You know, when you start really trusting and you don't think that you personally have to figure out how to survive, how to take care of everything, the whole world opens up. You know, we call it like the holographic universe. Your mind gets so lined up that, that the doors just open, 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 open. And they've been opening for 36 years. They've been opening in 44 countries. I've had started centers in Hawaii and Spain in Mexico, in Australia, and around the world. And it's not David doing it, because it's not a personal thing. The Spirit goes before you when you say, I will, I will serve your will. I want to know God, all you really, that's the prayer of the heart.
if you want to know God and you really put the faith in that, then you start to let go of the other things. Another way I could say it, Reverend Bev, is that in Lesson 50 of A Course in Miracles, the lesson is, I am sustained by the love of God. And then Jesus says, you believe you are sustained by everything else but the love of God. Pills, money, protective clothing, being right, knowing the right people. And then 20, 26, you know, lessons later, it's like lesson 76, I am under no laws but God's. You believe in the laws of medicine. You believe in the laws of economics. You believe a fluid pushed through a sharpened needle will ward off disease. Ho ho! Jesus is talking about vaccinations in A Course in Miracles. <laughs> How's that for relevant? <laughs> this was written back and published back around 76, 1976, but he says, you really believe a fluid pushed through a sharpened needle can ward off disease. You believe in the laws of economics, you believe in the laws of nutrition, you even believe in the laws of friendship. Wow! You mean there's laws of friendship that are made up by the ego? No wonder I've been people-pleasing. No wonder I felt guilt in my relationships. The ego has permeated everything of time and space for the purpose of guilt, keeping guilt. Because that's how it perpetuates itself through guilt through fear and guilt and anger. So, that it's been a great adventure and it's, it's not so much like the hero's adventure because in the end I, I, I tell people, you know, it's nothing, nothing special happened to David at all other than I just, in mind, I just said yes to God and I just said, you direct my, my life instead of me trying to direct it. I tried it on my own. It didn't go very well. It was not going well at all. But when I gave it over, like let go and let God, and I mean not just in the words, but in an actual sense of it, then things un unfolded. Even meeting Svava, Svava had, was over in, in Europe, you were in Denmark, and you were, had this, you knew I was doing a, a, like a five-day retreat in Holland. And she signed up, and then she got fear. And she tried to send an email taking back her registration, and she never heard back from the organizer. She had registered, and then she couldn't unregister. Later on, we met the guy and his girlfriend, and they were, they were traveling in a camper, was it in Finland? Norway, in Norway. And he said, oh yeah, I got that email. I didn't do anything with it. <laughs> I didn't, feel to I, didn't, I didn't feel to answer it, the organizers said. So that's how we met, an email request. Please, no, I don't, I want to unregister. He ignored it. We met him uh, later on at the gatherings, and, and that all worked out. And yeah, Svava's shared on YouTube, you know, some, a lot of her aspects of, of her steps, but it's the same thing that I'm sharing. It's really the same, same story. Do you have a song for that? <laughs> what about simple life? Oh yeah, that's a good one for that. I think I think uh, we're talking the most simple life you could ever fathom. Yeah.
clearly see that all is one with me. This is the life I long to live. All my pain I want to forgive. To give a simple life in light I want to live. It is your voice I hear so clearly. It is your light that surrounds my heart. It is your love I feel so deeply. This is the vision that shows me life. This is the life I long to live. All my simple life. That's all we're praying for. <laughs> Please, give me a simple life. I want a simple life of joy. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Do you use the microphone? Or sure. sure. Okay. I have two questions. Okay. 
It's just such a blessing, this opportunity. Oh, so yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, I am curious what you told the boat group in Oklahoma about sexuality. I love to hear what, because I don't remember the Course of Miracles talking about it. I remember them talking about like holy relationships, yeah. um, but that to me is the same as sexuality. Yeah. So that's one question. And then my second question, or should I ask both, is unrelated. Maybe it's related. I don't know. Well, maybe we'll just do one at a time. Okay. <laughs> That's a tiny one. Anyway. Sexuality. It's, it's it's a tiny one. <laughs> She's like, one little question. You know. <laughs> then we'll get into the second one. Okay, you, cool. Yeah. Well, when the, the course was first dictated, um, oftentimes Helen would write something down and Jesus would say, what I said was this, what you wrote was this. And there was a point where Jesus shared that um, sexual impulses are misdirected miracle impulses. And then he said to her, go back, I want you to change it to physical impulses are misdirected miracle impulses. Physical impulses, meaning when we think of sexuality, we think of maybe a libido and a sex drive and and sexual attraction. And Jesus says, yeah, that those are misdirected miracle impulses, but so are hunger and thirst. Some of you remember Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the pyramid, the basic needs at the bottom. Jesus was just telling us, well, as a human being, you seem to, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you have sexual feelings, you, you feel hot, you feel cold, you feel all kinds of things, but Basically, these are misdirected miracle impulses. And then he says, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. You can see where he's going. So what is a misdirected miracle impulse? It's just that through that unconscious, I talked about the subconscious mind, which is the darkened mind, this, the hidden secret mind, that the light of the miracle can come through it. But, but just like a light that passes through a prism or a filter gets split, like a beam of light can get split into a rainbow of colors. That's what happens with the miracle impulse. Every time you're really hungry, you're, you're hungry for God. You're hungry to remember the Creator. Every time you're thirsty, you're thirsty for the Creator. Every time you have a sexual attraction, you're attracted underneath it to a burning love that, that you would weep, Jesus says, if you remembered how much love there was, you would weep. There's so much love. Tears would just start flowing down your face if you began to remember how much love is there. So, so what that's saying is, is that everything that we call the basic human needs are still based on the belief in need, and which is, which is based on lack, which is what the ego is. So the light's still shining through. The light's so bright. We can't keep it out of our mind, but it comes through like the light going through a prism where we're attracted to things in form. And because of the belief in lack, we believe we need to have those things in form. You know, a sexual interaction or partner, food, a good meal <laughs> when you're hungry, a, a nice drink of uh, water when you're thirsty, and so on and so forth. But what Jesus is saying, and he said this 2,000 years ago to the woman at the well, after he told her all about her life <laughs> and everything, and she thought, oh my God, what have I got this Jewish prophet next to me? He said, drink of me and you will never thirst again. You hear the Holy Spirit coming through there. Drink of me and you will never thirst again. Because he had transcended time and space. And that's why even the resurrection scene was just a skit, little skit in time and space to show you can't really kill the Christ. That's all the resurrection really was, was just a little skit showing that you can't kill your divinity. So, now it, to take it one step further, because then people say, well, how do I deal with that now? Well, it's like it's all under guidance. In other words, Jesus is saying, if, if you believe in lack, you are going to eat and you're going to thirst, you're going to have these sexual attractions, 
And basically he's just saying, please bring them under my guidance. You know, I'm not going to rip the world away from you because you believe in it. If you had a little child who was having a nightmare and they were tossing and turning and you could tell your child was having a nightmare, you wouldn't necessarily try to go in and wake them from the dream in the middle of their nightmare because they may perceive your hand as a monster. And I, it's happened to me sometimes when somebody jolts me when I'm in the middle of a nightmare. You, you perceive the, the waking up as part of the something's trying to get you if you're having a fearful dream. So Jesus is saying, let me guide you on, on your eating. Let me guide you on your sexuality. Let me guide you on, on your profession, your, your career, in your job. Just be open to me guiding you very practically and very specifically every day. Uh, that's your intuition. Those are those little nudges and prompts that we get. Now, when people think about relationships, obviously this lack and this need thing and, and using people for sexuality or using a partner for, for money or resources or things in the world, that's pretty common in the world where two people come together and collaborate and they share resources and, and a house and so on and so forth, and they make a commitment. And Jesus is saying, good, I can use it. Even in a committed relationship, in a committed monogamous relationship, I can still use that to help you release the unconscious guilt. You see, some people, it's more like with yoga. You have, you have a yoga practice, that's a mind discipline. It may look like it's a body discipline, but it's, Tina can tell you, it's, it's a mind discipline. She just was teaching yoga in the park today. And, and whatever you're doing, if you start to think of it in terms of how is this training my mind to be more in alignment with my source, that's when you're, you go in the right direction. It's not something we try to analyze or figure out, and there's no shoulds and shouldn'ts and, you know, all these kind of rules and laws. Jesus was, was saying there's only one law, and that's the law of love. But you made up the ego, and you made up a bunch of other laws, gravity, you know, economics. <laughs> you've, you've made a lot of, of laws of lack to, to cover over the divine law of love. But he said, I'll help you unwind. So that's, for me, the way the, the spiritual, we were talking about gentleness. I heard you guys talking at, at dinner tonight about, let's, let's pray for gentleness. Let it be gentle. Let, please let it be gentle. And that is really just saying, I want to live a more of an intuitive life. I want to be very prayerful. Before I just jump into things out of guilt, I want to be prayerful and really feel the purpose of, of what I'm doing. I want to put my heart into it. And that's kind of the way my life has gone. I, didn't, I never set out to write books. And there's now these, all these books. I, didn't, I don't write books. I just talk. And then people transcribe the talks and edit them, and turn, turn them magically into books. And then they say, you're an author. Well, I've never sat down to write a book. But it happens because it's just it's helpful symbols. Like that, the book that Kyle has, This Moment is Your Miracle, there's exercises in there, there's things you can practice, like you actually put into practice. And so that's, that's like a quick summation of your sexual question. But that's kind of what's going on in the mind level. And that's where the purification, you know, has to take place. But it, it usually takes place through lots of guidance and instruction. And willingness, yeah. And you had a second question too. Yeah, I had a second question. Um, um, the second question was, what um, practice, or how could I shift like my thinking around, around, um, bo around body issues, like like say I have recurring headaches, or say I have like recurring like eczema or like like things that and that you know 
I like pray every day and have experienced like miraculous healing. Like I had sciatica for two years and experienced a miraculous healing of letting go of that extreme pain. Mm -hmm. But now in my day to day, sometimes I have like smaller pains and and it's it's if, if I know the miraculous is possible, but in the everyday, like I would love to be free of like you know, like the yeast infections or like of like 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 just like ailments. So I'll I'll leave it at that. I don't yeah, yeah. Well, there was a there was a Course in Miracles student called Louise Hay, <laughs> and and Louise Hay was was really yeah. really loved to, to start with the symptom level, the body's symptom level, and then trace it back into the mind. Like, what is the core thought or the core belief that this is showing me? So you see, then you start to see the body as just a a reflector, as a mirror. And then once you start thinking of the body in that way, what is this showing me in my mind? That, that's what Louise Hay did. She literally wrote a whole book, You Can Heal Your Life, based on that one thing. And then there, Jesus almost makes reference. He doesn't say Louise Hay by name, but, but he does say a careful tracing back from the, the form of the symptom to the mind can be helpful, but the main thing that heals is, is forgiveness. In, in other words, even when you trace it back to the thought or the belief, you still have to let it go. You see, <laughs> even if you trace it, uh, I'm having recurring headaches, ah, here's the thoughts I've been thinking of, and then you have to get to the point where let go and let God, where would I rather be right about this pain or suffering that I'm experiencing, or would I rather be happy? Would I rather release it and be happy? And that's the point of forgiveness. That's the point of, of letting go. There was a, a, a Jesus Chandler one time who, um, he, he was, he had carried some, he was living in Hawaii and he had carried some groceries and some heavy bags of grocery and then he felt all this back pain. And so, he he finally just sat down in the chair and he prayed and he went into all right Jesus tell me help me what's going on and and Jesus said well you think you just strained your back by carrying those heavy grocery bags in he said but actually that pain is coming from a from a past memory of when you were born your mother took you to a christian science a facility to be born, and it was a breech birth, and and you're feeling the back pain because you still haven't forgiven uh, your mother, and you still haven't forgiven the people that that brought you into the world with a breech birth. <laughs> and he was just like, that's that's what it shows you how deep it goes. It goes way way down into the subconscious. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with what's going on in form. Problem is, is when you look for the things and what is in form that's causing me the headaches and things like this. It's a very tiny perspective when you look when you know you're sitting on an iceberg of <laughs> unconscious darkness, and it's just the past coming up for release. So then this guy Paul, he was like, "Okay, all right, Jesus." And then Jesus said, "Now I'll tell you something. It never happened." The breach birth never happened. Here we go into the great Lord who's taking us back to the I am presence. It never happened. The grievance that you held against your your mother, the grievance for what that breach birth. Because birth is again another concept that, that the ego invented. There's no birth and death in eternity. But you see how the ego just keeps manipulating the images like smoke and mirrors, and it's trying to use the things of time and space to protect itself. It's like a little spider hiding in a well. And if you shine a flashlight down into the dark well, it will move away from the light. It will literally go and hide. Wherever the light goes, the spider will hide. So, so that's why, you know, I always advocate prayer, journaling, talking to a mighty companion, you know, you, you may start to 
uncover some thoughts that maybe you had been thinking but you hadn't shared with anybody. Like Paul did when he was saying to Jesus, what happened with this back, with this back pain? And then Jesus worked him all the way back to, it didn't happen. But you see, he worked it back into the past and a memory. And that's often what we're doing. We're, we're, we're dealing with these generational issues and memories that have been in our family tree, we'll say, in the world for many generations. And now we're just starting to rise up and starting to realize, wow, I'm innocent. I, I don't have to keep playing that script out. I don't have to keep, you know, choosing these things. I can, I can be guided. I can live an inspired life. And then you're just following your inspiration. So the more you follow your inspiration, the more those things just kind of fade away. You know, the pains, the, the little pains start to fade, fade away. As your mind lights up, <laughs> there's no room <laughs> for the pain. Wasn't that a Carly Simon song? Haven't got time for the pain. pain. Haven't the need for the pain. Haven't the room for the pain. Yeah. Not since I've known you. <laughs> That's it. That's good. Okay, any more questions? You're welcome. Yes. In the Course in Miracles, it says, I have never sinned. And say you're beginning to uh, be willing to accept that. But you have family members that are continuously reminding you of grievances that they have. How do you deal with that? Well, our function is is always to overlook the error. So, you know, Jesus says that that sin is an error to be corrected. And you might say that these family members are, again, always doing us a favor because whatever they're saying and they're doing um, is showing us an opportunity to really look inside experientially and from an emotional place to see, do I believe in the error or not? <laughs> Especially if my family relatives are saying, you know, you have sinned, you have, you know, reminding you of, of these errors. And Jesus does say in the Course, the role of the accuser will appear in many forms and it will seem to be accusing you, but have no fear, it will go at last. Gosh, it will go at last. <laughs> it's been going on for generations and it will go at last. Yeah, have no fear. It will go at last. You, your mind will be set free. So you might think of people, instead of thinking them as people, uh, think of them as thoughts. So as long as these thoughts keep appearing in consciousness and they keep pointing the finger and accusing, they are just nothing more than forgiveness opportunities. I know with, with my biological family, with my, my father, he, you know, he, he wasn't happy. He was in a job, a career he didn't like. He felt very tied down, very limited. And he was quite angry uh, for quite a few years. And he would say things to me like, you know, as I would pray, study the Course, he would say, no good, dirty, rotten bum, get a job. I'm trying to be like St. Francis that he was telling me, get the job. And and actually it got to the point where where I, I think I talk about this a little bit in in a book that came through me called Forgiveness, uh, Quantum Forgiveness. Quantum Forgiveness, Physics, Meet Jesus. That's the name of the book. <laughs> Quantum Forgiveness, Physics, Meet Jesus. And so, in that book, I talk about my relationship with my father and, and how I saw finally that it was, it was coming all from my mind. And when I finally saw that I, it was all coming from my mind, he came to me one day and he said, he said, David, I really wasn't a very good father. And I said, not for an instant do I believe that. I said, you did the best that you could do based on what you believe, I did the best that I could do based on what I believe, and it's over now. And he lit up, we both, our relationship just lit up like a firecracker at that point, because I was basically saying, I'm not going to hold the past to you at all, and I'm not going to hold the past on me either. 
We're, we are now born again, and we had such a happy relationship from that point. But it took me to come to that point where people would say, well, you're, you're working for, with the Course. Well, your, your dad really changed a lot. And I said, no, no, I, my mind changed. I said, let's be, let's be honest about this. I changed my mind and then I saw the witness to that. And it was beautiful. It was just amazing, loving and beautiful. So that's all I would say is if, if that's happening again and again, it's just an opportunity to get to the point where you can really speak it from your heart and say, no, I, I'm not holding myself to the past and I'm not holding you to the past either. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's be honest. We don't want to hold on to the past at all. It's it's not serving us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have time maybe for a closing song. We're almost a few minutes away. Do you have a song about my savior or something? Yeah. Here we are. Center for Spiritual Living. What's the name of the song? My Savior. My Savior. Okay. Here we are. Let's hear what this one is.
take my hand and we fly free you take my hand and we fly free who am i without the Let me realize what I hear is true All I long is to be with you You are my savior, I believe in you Shows me the darkness is made up by me. Takes my hand and leads me to fly free. You take my hand and we fly free. You take my hand. And we fly free, you take my hand and we fly free, you take my hand and we fly free. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you everyone. It's been just wonderful being here with you. Very touching, very profound, and yeah, it's just an honor that we can be here and witness to this together, you know, because we all want to, to have someone take our hand and fly free. We want the feeling of freedom, and I'm so grateful that you're all here and we can share in this together. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a beautiful trip for us. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and we're kind of mystics in the deepest sense, so yeah. We, every trip we take, everything we do, we think, hmm, this could be the last one. Because <laughs> uh, I know Spava has such a, a draw into the stillness and is doing a lot of painting and poetry and art and podcasts. But then, yeah, so we're, we're enjoying it. Jesus has just been saying, just enjoy yourselves. So we are thoroughly enjoying ourselves with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.